Mm, that was a that was a full full pop one. of a can. That was a good one. It was real good. I got the El Segunda El Segundo Steve Austin's Stone Cold Steve Austin's IPA Broken Skull <laughs> IPA, which is hilarious. Uh, uh, but it's a one pint can, so it's got a little bit more depth to it. What's the percentage? Full, full resonant sound. What's the percentage on that sucker? Uh, dude, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> six point seven. There you go. That's a real beer. That's a real so. beer. <laughs> so, man, this would be DCI Finals week. What is yeah, would tonight be quarters? No, it's, no, tomorrow well, Thursday night Thursday. quarter finals. Yeah. But we would probably well, we would have already been well into planning weeks ago our annual trip to Indianapolis mm-hmm. to stay at a, stay at an Airbnb and go check out the lots and. Maybe sneak into semifinals and then watch finals lots or something. Yeah, in in drum corps absence, I don't know about you. This this summer has flown by. The, like July was like a blink of an eye to me. Well, in some aspects, yes. In some aspects, no. At first, during like all course lockdown and stuff, it was creeping by, and it felt like April and May were a year long themselves. <laughs> and then like two weeks ago, somebody was like, "Oh, today would be the Atlanta regional or DCIE East Allentown." And I was like. Holy crap, that went by fast. Yeah. It's and just not being able to follow the groups around and mm-hmm. not being able to have much content because there's no shows and no competing and no lot videos to binge watch. So a yep. little, little depressing. Yep. So let's try and fix that depression with today's episode. <laughs> so I'll get into the intro here. So welcome everyone to the Aged Out Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Fantini, and with me as always is Evan Worrell. And before we get into today's guest and letting him introduce himself, make sure you hit subscribe on the YouTube channel, like the video, leave a comment if you want. Uh, if you prefer, subscribe on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We're also on there. Follow on Instagram and Facebook to never miss an update about the podcast. And lastly, if you want to give any kind of financial support, feel free to hit us up on patreon.com slash aged out podcast. Now, Evan, take it away. And let's get into this thing. Sure, yeah. Uh, so today's guest we just kind of connected with through social media, through the the grapevine and the small two degrees of separation that exist in the uh, the drumming world. Uh, without further ado, please welcome uh, Kyle Suchia. What's up, Kyle? What's up? Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking the time. I have never met you before, or maybe I have, but never conversed in long forum like this, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, man, we're, we're happy to have you. I don't think we've ever had anyone from Minnesota on, which is where you're mm-hmm. joining us from. Correct. That's correct. So how's the weather up there in Minnesota? Uh, it's nice in the summer, man. I, I like people always think it's like a blizzard up here year round, but it's not true. It is like that for several months of the year, but, <laughs> um, but what makes it worth it is, is the, the gorgeous summers we have up here. Um, and, and we're kind of experiencing that right now so yeah I, i'm a, I, I was telling you about this earlier i'm a minnesota boy at heart I, I i've seen the world i've been on you know three drum corps tours and i spent a winter in la and i still i still like it here so Dude, there's still- nothing wrong with that i have grown more and more fond of kentucky as i've gotten older and i've obviously on tour seen a lot of the country and been out of the country to Ireland and stuff like that. And when I come home, I'm like, man, it ain't so bad to live in Kentucky. Like, it's not too bad. No, I'm a fan. I haven't gotten tired of it either. But that was definitely, like, the weather in Minnesota in the summer being a misconception I had. Like, I didn't expect it to be cold when I was there for for my two summer tours I did. But I'm pretty sure the way it lined up, like, with the July or whenever we were in Minnesota, Wisconsin area, Mm -hmm. that was, like, the hottest part of tour. I know for sure it was the hottest part in 2010. Like it was like 111 in Wisconsin the day we were there. Really, it was insane. Wow, and like so, like you go down to Texas and it, you cooled off. It, I'm not joking. Like we went from up <laughs> that's, there, that's worked wild. our way to Texas, and it was not as bad in Texas than the three or four days we spent in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And maybe that was probably an outlier, but it just blew it, my yeah, mind. it sounds like an outlier. It, I mean, it, it's not like it doesn't happen here ever, but but uh, <laughs> yeah, we 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 pretty rarely get up that high yeah it it was it was the heat index was 111 obviously it wasn't the actual just raw temperature but it was it was sweltering well i'm sorry that that was your experience (laughs) (laughs) i believe my only show that i was ever supposed to have in minnesota got canceled is kalamazoo where the university is uh no that's That's michigan Michigan. oh yeah michigan well wait hold on 
there there is a like a DCI Minnesota that's like it's like you or historically it's been like it's like a regional type yeah it, yeah kind of a regional but not really and in that that's in Minneapolis in the on the University of Minnesota campus okay that's I the think one that, that got one canceled. Got canceled in 2010 yes it did in 2010 it did, it did. i remember and that it was spent, like a tornado warning yep yeah we spent like the whole time in the the basketball arena or hockey arena or something <laughs> waiting for that <laughs> they're waiting to see if the tornado would yeah. pass but then they just ended up canceling it yeah. i remember yeah, it was I remember funny that. sidebar which will probably be our first of many is that like everybody's pretty much in there just chilling out like whatever hanging out seeing your friends from other cores yeah. and i remember very vividly the boston crusaders like staying in full uniform and like standing at attention. I was like, what are you guys doing? Right <laughs> yeah. It's like, what are you guys doing? It's right too now? much. It's too but much. Anyway. <laughs> well, dude, Kyle, um, I guess we'll, uh, kind of just kick this off and get into it by just allowing you to introduce a little bit of your background, how you got into music, drumming, um, inspiration into like, obviously the activity that we're talking about, which is marching band and, uh, drum corps in that scenario in that scene so uh we'll let you take it away man yeah so I, I my mom loves it when i throw this in here but she she likes to take all the credit for my drawing ability because um she was drumming while i was in the womb <laughs> uh my, my parents were both yeah shout out mom um my parents were both uh japanese taiko drummers um sick and so yeah i so i grew up kind of around drumming and and knew that that was kind of a hobby or a, a passion that i wanted to pursue you know and then i i kind of took the traditional uh band route i you know started concert band in fifth grade you know did it through middle school um first discovered the marching activity um through our district's band camp thought it was the coolest thing ever um got involved in, in in the later years of high school really decided that this was something I wanted to continue doing uh, upon graduating and, and it was like in the middle years of high school that I, I discovered drum corps probably around the time that you guys were marching and uh, yeah I, I uh, senior year of high school started auditioning places um, I, I actually auditioned for blue coats uh, in for the 2014 season um and i got further than i thought i would but i it ended up working out both both me and aaron bailey who you, you guys know yeah uh, ended up making it to the april camp only to get cut then which you know was a was maybe a blessing in disguise i i, I maybe wasn't physically or mentally ready to um take on the the beast that is a drunk horror tour um and so i i, I marched minnesota brass that summer the drum corps um in dca uh went back auditioned for blue coats again for the next summer made it spent an, an amazing three years there um and then as far as winter goes uh i marched minnesota brass for four years um starting in 2015 um and then i have i had a bonus year so i decided to put my life on pause and, and move all the way out to southern california and and had a really amazing experience aging out with broken city um in 2019 um so yeah lots of lots of great memories lots of good experiences i, I i'm still involved in, to some extent I, I do some teaching here and there um i'm also uh involved in the minnesota viking skull line um which has been an awesome avenue to keep performing and make a surprising amount of money uh doing it which is <laughs> cool Nice. Uh, and probably get some sweet I, gear and apparel. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. That, it's almost worth it just for the the hats and hoodies I get. And I, I also was involved in the college band world. I went to the University of Minnesota um, and was in the band there for all four years. So um, yeah, I think that Golden uh, Gophers. The Golden Gophers. Um, so yeah, I think that about covers my marching career. So your time in high school at Eden Prairie. Um, I watched some YouTube videos. You guys were pretty good. Definitely way above well, average for what a high school. Um, yeah, it was kind high of. Drum line is. It, it was kind of the perfect storm. Um, like I, I came in my freshman year. I didn't really realize it at the time, but we like weren't that good. <laughs> um, and, and we didn't even have like a WGI program in place yet. But like um, 
my high school class and the years kind of around us were really motivated to get good and and the staff we had um, was really motivated and really good educators as well um, and and they kind of um, took advantage of our uh, skill and desire to get better and so we started a uh, our or I guess restarted our WGI program in my sophomore year in 2012 um, and competed in WGI open class that year. We like got 17th or something. So we didn't make finals. Heck yeah. Uh, and then the next year, like we came out kind of on fire. We didn't, I, I didn't, I don't think I fully realized it at the time, but we were like, pretty good and we ended up getting promoted to world class that year and, and got 10th um that's a awesome. pretty drastic jump yeah year. i know it, it's, a, big yeah, leap. it's pr- a pretty sizable jump i don't know i don't really fully know what happened <laughs> uh but we got pretty good all of a sudden and the show was cool and um so yeah we got we got 10th and then the next year we got 14th and and um yeah and and eden prairie has kind of been able to sustain a a, a decent level of quality um Ever since then, um, I, I think this year, like they, they've kind of been a bubble world class group. I think this past year they were in open class, um, but uh, but yeah, it's it, it, it's pretty cool that uh, kind of the drumline program. I got to see it kind of start and grow into what it is today, and I'm very thankful for to to have had that experience there because it set me up really well to succeed in DCI and WGI. So. Thinking back, and it might not be easy to backtrack, but you said that kind of you guys had like a hunger to just like get really good. Do you think that that was attributed to an exposure to like drum corps, DCI, WGI, or were there any like staff changes or people that came into the program? They're like, hey, we really have the setup uh, and the resources to kind of make this like a, a thing we should we should really strive for it was there anything like do you remember changing or just like you got together and like drummed outside of rehearsal with like your close friends like hey let's let's like just drum all the time or i don't know that's kind of hard yeah, to think back kinda, on that stuff but I, I think it was kind of all of the above i mean we had th- there was a somewhat of a staff leadership change from my freshman year to my sophomore year of high school um it it kind of became excuse me it kind of became led by some younger guys that had marched uh, high level drum corps and, and winter groups. And they, I think they too did a good job of exposing us to the right things. Like when we were first, just when, you know, winter drum line was just an idea that we had to potentially start, you know, they started showing us videos of, you know, we the the first like kind of show we did was like we we bought a box six show and it was like pulses brief from 2009 shout and, out john mapes and Ian grom yeah yep <laughs> um and and so we were we kind of used that as like a as a, like a north star of like what the activity is and what we could do um and i i think all of us were really inspired by that and it, the 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 momentum kind of just kept going from there and and yeah like you know like the students were motivated uh on their own to spend time outside of rehearsals and and just hang when we're hanging out you know everybody would just bring their pads and like drumming and practicing kind of just became the social thing to do for us and so um yeah like i said it was just kind of this perfect storm of, of of everything falling into place good teachers good students um that that kind of drove that success you know i I think i would argue that like go ahead mike yeah everybody's always wondering what the secret sauce is for these really good high school groups and they're picking these staff members brains and obviously you need good leadership you need experienced people good teachers and writers and designers to succeed but at the end of the day none of that matters unless the kids are motivated and they're fully bought in like that's ultimately why one of the reasons I think John Mapes at Chino Hills is so successful and has been, he built that culture and just has kept it going. And the kids have totally bought in. Like to me, that's the secret sauce, not Mm -hmm. having Mike McIntosh, write your book or some really well-known drill writer, write your drill or whatever. It's just all on the kids. If they want it, 
Like they're going to have a much higher chance of success than if you're trying to like drag them along all season. I think that's important to know, to note for like any kids listening to like, Oh, what do we need to do for like our group to get the next step? It's like, well, there are some things that have to happen from like a leadership standpoint in your instruction. But I mean, every staff that I've ever been in front of or being on staff at times now with groups has always said like, look, we want you guys to push us. Like, we don't want to do it because there's only so like far we can drag you. But if you guys are push us and are motivated, drumming outside of rehearsal, that sort of stuff reminds me of kind of the the culture that was established at my high school and some of those groups. And looking back on it, there was like a kind of a spur of kids like myself and some kids that marched when I did. And then years after that went on to March Drum Corps just because the kind of the pathway had been paved and like they saw like, oh, this is this is what it takes to get um i think a lot of people always ask me like how'd you how'd you make so-and-so group or how'd you do so-and-so group i'm like well i just i just drummed all the time that's really what really what happened to it 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 reminds me too uh i watched some of your youtube videos it was funny i did a deep dive one of your first ones you ever posted was a uh you playing a pantera lick off of uh (laughs) snare science and it's funny because one of the comments on there could have been a friend of yours that marched with or it could have just been like a YouTube troll. It's like, who knew that this kid with like jacked up traditional grip would one day be a center snare for the blue coats or something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody yeah, starts start somewhere. somewhere. <laughs> yep. So like, it's just like, it's a, it's a process. You got to build it. The building blocks start and they start real, real, real slow. And then eventually they start to kind of snowball downhill in your favor. But, um, so yeah, obviously that and some friends of yours at high school and obviously Zach, who I don't know, but then I saw, oh, Zach Fitzgibbon went to the same high school as Kyle. So obviously there yeah. was some good pedagogy and stuff in there that uh, set them up for success. And I'm sure there's probably been even kids after you guys have left that have done stuff past high school um, based on that trail base, trailblazing path you created. Uh, so you did Minnesota Brass DCA after you got cut. Which is an important distinction that I don't think that I will ever not talk about on any podcast. I've been cut. Mike's been cut. Everybody's been cut. Yep. Don't give up when you get cut. <laughs> <laughs> Use it as fuel. Up, Lucas, I think, so. so do you have any, from that experience of getting cut at the Blue Coats, did, did you go into that expecting to make it that far? Or did you kind of go oh, just like on no. a whim? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I had honestly no idea really what to expect um um i just went because i thought the blue coats were cool and and went you know looking to meet new people and just learn as much as i could and 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 i think that's the appropriate approach to have especially for a first audition like Mm -hmm. like it just doesn't it doesn't hurt to just go you know Mm -hmm. like like prepare like crazy and and present your best self um, and then go and, and learn and meet some cool new people. And, and, um, cause, cause a, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> like, I didn't know I was going to even get a call back and I did. And B, you know, you start to plant the seed, you, you become a face that that staff, you know, starts to recognize. And then you come back the next year and, 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 you know, the staff seeing a familiar face and then seeing the improvement you've made over the past year, that, that goes a long way um, as far as your chances of actually making it. So, um, yeah. And it, it just really allows you to see where the bar actually is, like what the finish line is. Like you don't know what you don't know. I the first exactly. drum core audition I went to was for blue coats for the summer of 2007 they had an incredible amount of vets come back for that criminal show, which ended up being like a phenomenal drum line. And I was just like, yeah, I'm, I, I walked in. I was like, yep, not even close. Very quickly <laughs> realized that I had a lot of work to do, but that was really my first experience outside of like my high school setting to just know like, okay, this is, this is what it takes. So I got a lot of work to do and you can either take that one of two ways you can f- fight or flight like give in or just be like i just gotta go work harder so yeah don't give up yep so So, obviously came back after 2014 getting cut in april made 2015 and man that was one heck of a line to start with like did you guys have any inkling before the season that it might be as good as it was 
Uh, no, because I like the snare line especially was eight rookies, and and we were all you know it was kind of a a, a unique dynamic group of guys of people from across the country with different backgrounds and philosophies, but um, we made it work because we had a great leader in Mike Davis and everybody was just really motivated and, 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 and everybody came with like a solid understanding of how to drum. Obviously like you don't make the blue coats without that, um, mm-hmm. but everybody was just, just really motivated and, and I think gelled really well together um, despite everybody's different backgrounds. So um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, I, I had no idea that that was going to be what it was <laughs> going into the season. That um, and like and too, I think um, the Blue Cuts drew a lot of talent um, coming out of 2014, especially like a lot of people really liked that show and uh, that drum line in particular and wanted to be a part of it. So uh, you know, everybody that made the line was talented. There were no ticks really. If, if there was any a tick, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it, it, it was a super fun summer. It was it was an incredibly challenging summer for me. You know, like it being my first drum corps tour at you know at a group that demanded such a high le- level of performance, and and I was on the end, and the drill was really hard, and <laughs> so so it was it was a it was a summer of tremendous growth for myself uh, personally, um, and uh, yeah, just such a cool show, and and lots to look back on fondly there. For sure. Yeah, that was a that was a great, I would say, representation of a group that was on an upward trajectory the whole time. Um, at least me thinking back on it, on like witnessing it early season versus like what it was finals week and like peaking at the right time. I mean, there's countless videos and then judges tapes to to validate that as far as like what the end performance was and how sweet that must have felt for you guys in the line to just peak at the right time. Do you, uh, I noticed on your Instagram, you had like your first picture. It might not have been the first picture, uh, but you posted it like when you tried on your uniform um, for the blue coats, was that like yeah. validation for you? I saw Courtney Thomas in the background and I love Courtney. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah Courtney and then, uh, so there was that moment like, all right, like kind of like became real, like you're in move-ins, you got the uniform on now your weeks away or days away from the show. Like you're like, all right, I made it. Yeah, no. And uh, if I remember correctly, that was like maybe halfway into spring training. And like, it's like when you're in spring training, like it's easy to get, it's easy to lose track of, of what you're, why you're there and and what you're shooting for, because frankly it sucks, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like, like, like you, you get kind of get lost in the reps and, you're sore and, and tired and everything, but then um, sunburns or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, then that was kind of a, that was kind of a triggering moment for me. I remember like putting the uniform on because th- that uniform was so cool <laughs> and, yeah. and, um, and you know, to, it, it, it like really felt real that I was a part of the group, uh, as soon as I put that on, um, you know, and, and, and I'm, and I'm, I, I, we we'll probably talk about this, but I, I um, am thankful that I got to wear it for a year <laughs> <laughs> yes. before, before everything else happened. Um, so yeah, the uniform yeah. Hey, blue coats were well, the trendsetters with those unis in sixteen, and that was one yeah. of the things I, I wanted to hit on. I don't think Evan put it on the outline, or I forgot to tell him to put it on there. But the transition, because like, I love like because fifteen still had the same uniforms from thirteen and fourteen, right? Yeah, I think maybe very similar. Variations. Yeah, it's, it was the same. Like dark navy had the yeah. long coat. And the, the, the sass was different from year to year, but yeah, the general look was the same. Yeah, I, I still I just couldn't imagine being uniform. Yeah, I couldn't imagine being at that uniform reveal, having worn those in fifteen. And the sixteen <laughs> uniforms worked with the show. Ended up working well, I thought. Yeah. But like in move-ins, they show you guys that. Like, what's going through your all's brains? No, I I remember I remember it so vividly. Like, like it, it was at the the like intermediate school that we do camps at. It was it was in April camp. They like first showed us the uniform, um, and like all the drum, the, all the battery guys were sitting together, and 
I forget who, but somebody walked out like modeling the uniform and we were all like looking around at each other, like what the hell <laughs> is this? Like, and, and like, I, I don't blame myself for thinking that way. Cause like, truth be told up close, that uniform doesn't look good. Like, like I, I still think that, but you're right. Like I, I, we, we all really had no choice. We had signed our contracts already. We just kind of had to trust the process and the, the, that the design team knew what the hell they were doing and that it would go over well <laughs> competitively. Um, and, and it, and it did. And, and, yeah. and, you know, when you watch the show, like from the stands uh, or in videos, it, it like, it does work. Um, but, and, and, you know, it, it does make sense to like, in a very um, literal sense, like, we were able to do things in that show with our bodies that we wouldn't have been able to do in a traditional uniform, like slide down those slides. <laughs> you yeah, know? true. Um, so in, in a very their helmets or their sense. shakos everywhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. In a very practical sense, the uniform has worked really well too. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, that I uh, was appalled at first, truth be told when I first saw the uniform and like, and it was first coming to terms with the fact that I had to wear it. Um, but yeah, but yeah, it worked. <laughs> yeah. I, I would have been in that camp. Like 2012 was my year at the blue coats. And that was the last year they wore that style of uniform. And that was like one of the draws for me. Like, obviously I had friends that were marching there, Joe Woody, Tom guys from rhythm X and everything. And, and, but the uniform was like, man, those things are sweet. And I, I would have been pretty salty if I'd shown up to move ins and they were like, Hey, <laughs> You know yep. these really awesome things you came here to wear? Yeah, we're not doing that. Yeah. I guess I never really cared. I was like, I just want to drum well. I don't care. I mean, I would have done <laughs> they it. They changed I would, their uniforms a little bit of crown. I wouldn't have quit. And then in but... 13, they overhauled crown's uniforms. They went to the purple pants band. So, but... Well, and, and too, I, I'll add, like, as a performer, way more fun to perform with, like, like if once you get over the, like, the fact that you feel self-conscious wearing this tight white thing, like it's way more fun to perform without like a helmet or a shako on when you can actually see the audience and kind of um, react. It definitely takes you out of your them. shell a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It, it's yeah. a more it's a more personal it's a more personal experience, kind of like what you get as a pr performer in WGI. Yes, but in in a much grander scale uh, because it's a drum corps on a football field. Um, so in that in, in that sense, it was it was very cool too, um, very fun to perform that way. That was Mike and I differ on this, but that was why I always enjoyed WGI much more, was just because it was a much more intimate performance yes. setting. Like, I feel like all right, you can see me and I can see you, and like yeah, this is about to go down. So strap yeah, in. Totally. No, I'm with you there. Um, sure. See, for me, I always got off on like the like the the badassness of like the shako pulled real low over your eyes. Like you're like robots. I don't know. I always just tr very traditional <laughs> like that did it for me from an adrenaline standpoint. Like that was, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but I Sorry. totally get where you're coming from. And, and Evan has said the same thing about the whole, the years we've been doing this podcast. I think we're three years in now. Yeah, I don't this, know. This would like be the, really, this you've been doing it that long? Uh -huh. Yeah. Dude, you got some episodes to catch up on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I really do. There's I been, mean, I knew uh, you guys were doing this, but. 50 something what are we on uh i think this I will be know. 53 53 something like that wow there's yeah. been the, it's not always super consistent but that's all right we do it for fun and whatever yeah it's all good it'll go where we um, go so 16 17 comes out brand new uniform jagged line brand new uniform huge prop down the middle of the field uh yeah, yeah that was an interesting oh, design yeah. choice um <laughs> <laughs> but uh out of your three years, 15, 16, 17, obviously probably different experience with each. Do you have one that you would say is your favorite? Um, yeah, I usually pick 16. Um, and, and I mean, that, that, that feels like a cop-out answer because that's the year that we won. But <laughs> it's not. that's not why. Like, There's a lot of reasons. Like, um you know, I, I was in the middle, but not the center. So I could kind of just like, my only job was to play with Aaron Bailey chill. every day. And that was pretty easy. Yeah, it's pretty chill. And the show itself was fun to perform and not that tiring. <laughs> um, 
versus the previous year, which was extremely tiring. Um, yeah, I mean, I, and, and like I was a vet, not a rookie. Um, so it, it, it was just the, the most enjoyable summer all around for me, I would say, um, this, beyond the fact that we did well competitively. Um, I mean, that's not to say I had bad experiences in 15 and 17. Um, those were great, different, but great. You know, 15 being my rookie year and, and experiencing everything for the first time. 17 being the year I, I was able to assume the role of second leader and and take on that challenge. Um, but, yes, I, I would definitely say 16 was my favorite. Being in the middle with the responsibility is cool but also extremely stressful especially in full ensemble rehearsals i yeah you can't you can't turn it off at any moment no it's in the like marathon. you're constantly talking with the staff you're back and forth with like the caption heads like all right what's this feel like what's this sound like what are you guys coming in like here what are you thinking about like when are, how are you interpreting the drum major's hands you're like dude i'm just trying to play clean i, I don't i don't know <laughs> <laughs> like, i don't know what's going on yeah totally. um, but yeah so in, was 17 the first year that you marched uh, coats with Zach, or was he in 16 as well? Yep. Yeah, Zach has a very frenetic drum corps career. He, um, he, well, he marched Minnesota Brass with me in 2014, um, but then next year he marched Madison Scouts, then he went to Cadets, and then in, in 17 he went to Blue Coats, um, and then finally decided to stay at one corps for more than one year. That's cool <laughs> that you got to reconnect with like your high school friend, though. Like, yeah, and, made and, and we, yeah, Zach and I are really close. I mean, ever since high school, um, he ended up transferring to the University of Minnesota after a year. So we did college band together and we actually lived together for a semester. Um, and so, yeah, to, to, to share as many marching experiences as I have with him. And, and he marched, he and I marched Minnesota Brass together. All, we, we spent our entire WGI career together now that I think about it. Um, and so, um, to have him there for so much of my career, it, like, it w w was kind of nice because you know I love him to death, and um, just to have a familiar face, <laughs> uh, like when we moved to California and, and all that, that was, was really nice too. So, um, but yeah, so seventeen, he finally came to the came over from the dark side and uh, joined Blue Coats, and uh, <laughs> we had a good time. It was probably like just the dichotomy of going from what the cadets are to his summer at the blue coats. He's probably like, Oh my God. I can't well, believe uh, that. He, he, he would tell you though, that it wasn't that much of a difference. Uh, I think like it, the I only thing him. is like the only thing he, he, this is what he says. I, I, I don't know for sure, but um, like the only thing is like, sometimes he would get told to play quieter. Um, but <laughs> other than, other than that, like, I mean, like the cadets, they're known for like cranking and running all the time and, and being, you know, really running intense, guns. but, but that's not, you know, that's not to say the blue coats are, are that different, you know, like I'd say the blue devils from what I've heard are very different than that, but like the blue coats <laughs> get their crank on too, you know? Um, so yeah, it, yeah. The, the the balance thing has been an issue for like for the the majority of the time I've known Zach. He likes to play loud, um, but uh, I relate to that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> I've always been a loud player. Always, it was always a battle because I was one in in both drum corps lines I was in, uh, and uh, yeah. I was on the end of Rhythm X in 2012. I was one in in 11, so like I've always been towards the outside. So it's like. But I have naturally dark, loud hands, so it's like I had to constantly be like taking taking the foot off the gas a little bit, like yep. always playing lower and softer than I feel like I should be. But I feel like indoor, it's like way easier to balance just because you're almost never in a straight line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're never in this form. We don't need to worry about it. Well, do you uh, remember? It's it's in 2012 at Rhythm X uh, prelims. Before there were three nights, we warmed up in the afternoon, and we literally hadn't played in a straight line like, but five times all season, even like warming up or anything. And it I was do bad. Remember that. And yeah, we, we changed like, it. We we're like, we're not doing this. <laughs> we were like, Josh, <laughs> put us in an arc. And there was put ten us in of a us who were super wide, but anyway. Yeah. The but, classic finals week changed everything. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like oh, we're oh, gonna yeah. warm up a straight line. We're like, what? 
<laughs> it was terrible. Like, you got sound bad. I was like, yeah, we don't do this. Like, <laughs> it's an art. Split us up. Do something uh, different. Anyway, um, so you did Minnesota Brass Indoor. That was for t- 2018. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I yeah. did it 2015 through 2018. Oh, dang. Nice. And then, so you made the choice or the decision to yep. jump across the the country. What was the attraction or decision? I mean, obviously, Roger Carter is at Blue Goats and Broken City. Um, what kind of was going through your mind of the attraction or what drew you to, like, pursue that? Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, I mean, I always dug – I, well, I, I shouldn't say always because Broken City is still a, a relatively new ensemble. But like from 2016 on, I had been following that group and always dug what they've done um, with their shows. Um, Mike Jackson is a is a brilliant mind, um, and so that was a draw. I wanted to kind of experience that, and then yeah, like just there was a lot of overlap and in terms of staff and members, um, you know, Roger was obviously a big draw. Um, one of my best friends, Jared Baltazar, March Blue Coats with, you know, I was talking to him about it. Chris Morales is another guy who did both Blue Coats and Blue Oregon City, you know, just having good conversations with, with those guys about what the vibe was like. And it just seemed like somewhere where I would fit in right away. And that's what I was looking for, you know, like I had developed, you know, spending four years at an ensemble like Minnesota Brass, who, who and, and like the decision was to leave wasn't out of spite for Minnesota Brass. I just like, it was just something I wanted to do for my last year. Right on. Yeah, yeah. I, I have so much love for Minnesota Brass. Oh, the organization a lot. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I spent four years there and had a really family-like relationship with everybody there. Um, so... I didn't want to kind of lose that and, and wanted to make a conscious choice about going somewhere where I would fit in, feel like I fit in really well. And um, just in those conversations I was having with people about Broken City and the vibe, but like, it, it just seemed like a place where that would happen uh, for me. And it did. So, um, and then there was like the logistical, um, yeah, we talked a little bit about this before. Uh, it's kind of yeah. like, a, I guess, a perfect storm or just yeah, everything fell into place. Like, or... like, the, like the company I was working for at the time had an office in L.A. They were, for some reason, they, like, they blessed them. They understood the value of my involvement in the activity and, like, not, not just understood it, thought it was cool um, and that, and understood that, um, it actually adds value to me as a professional too. Um, and so they let me go out there and, and work out of the company's LA office. I had like, did you create like a sales pitch for it? <laughs> no, I, no, I, <laughs> I probably should have. Um, but I, I basically, I just had a candid conversation with my boss and, um, every, and everybody was just like, yeah, you absolutely have to go do this. Um, I think the thing uh, and, that favors your corner is like, this is the last possible time in my life I can exactly. ever do this. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because, like, because, like, what I what I was gonna do if they weren't gonna let me go, I was I was gonna quit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I I the conversation never even got that far though. Like, I didn't have to threaten to quit to to get them to let me do it. Um, thankfully, uh, but yeah, like it was the last year. I I understood that it was the last year I could do it. You know, I would regret it for the rest of my life if I didn't. So. Um, yeah, was able to make it happen. I had like a, like a family friend's nephew who has a family that lives out in LA, the mid city neighborhood of LA. They have a really nice house with a studio apartment above their garage. And they let me rent it for like a thousand dollars a month, which is nothing in LA. LA. Uh, so I was living and working in the city during the week. Plus like, it was, it's amazing that I was even able to march that season at all. Like, like the, the age out rule is like you have to be 22 on April 1st at 12.01 a.m. And my birthday is April 1st at 3 a.m. So at 12.01 a.m. I was 22, but a couple hours later I was 23. So, but I, so because I was, you know, 
born a couple hours into April first. I was able to march that entire season. So <laughs> yeah, it's 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 pretty wild. Like I just it, it, I still to this day I'm like how lucky am I to have been able to do that and for things to have worked out the way they did. So mom coming in clutch again. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. She, yeah. Holding out. <laughs> <laughs> I always I always joke that I like knew when I was in. About to come out, I was like, "No, I, I was hanging on for dear life. Like, I, I need to stay in here a little longer. This is worth it." Uh, <laughs> yeah. What did your parents think of like? What, did you have a conversation with them? Like, uh, I'm gonna move to LA. Um, well, they, I, I am so lucky. My, I love my parents, and and they have always been so supportive of my passions, and um, my dad especially has always wanted me to do take advantage of the things I can do while I'm young, while I'm young. And so they were all for it. They, they have been all for uh, all of my endeavors in the marching arts. Um, and so the, like, you know, I, I, I did lean on them quite a bit as I was deciding whether or not to do it period. Um, because there was a lot on the line. I, you know, I was dating somebody at the time and, I, and you know, didn't know if it was going to work out with my job, but they were very encouraging um, of me. The, the only thing they were hesitant about was that it would set me back career-wise, but thankfully I was able to keep my job. So um, it, uh, yeah, yeah, it all it all worked out really well. Uh, so had a great season, obviously, gold medal. Um, that show was extremely challenging in many aspects um maybe not physically at least it didn't look so maybe it was but just from like i know mike jackson does so much nuance in his writing from a spatial demand and like metric demand um like the whole role at the end of the show that's just like a giant uh dicella rondo (laughs) where everybody's just got to feel it the same way (laughs) that thing was the pain of our existence (laughs) oh i know (laughs) <laughs> early on i was like man i hope they it get was, this because that'd be yeah. cool there was a risk yeah. cpa finals we won scpa finals but the roll tour <laughs> <That'd be laughs> the last thing we do i was scared for my life because i didn't want the last thing i play in my marching to career career to be like this terrible uh, decelerating roll um but and, and like all of finals week while we were in ohio like that was like the only thing we worked on all like the entire time. Um, but like, and, and, and prelims, it was bad. It was bad prelims. Everything else was good prelims, but the, the role was bad. Um, and so just suddenly like sem- semis morning, I think it like was suddenly good. And then it was just good the rest of the season. So, I mean, thank it's the finals week pixie dust. It's real it's magic. Yeah. The X is banked on that for, <laughs> Maybe it's entire existence. I swear. Yeah. It's the I don't finals know about week now, fairy dust. But there was about a decade there where it was like, well, we'll get clean finals week, guys. It'll just happen. We don't know how, but it will. Dude, we were terrible in 2012 until finals week. Yep. Some of that I'll blame on the weather. Like you guys down there in SoCal get to drum outside all year. And that, we're like, I mean, that was that was a completely new experience for me, though. Like you know, having being in Minnesota winners for four years. And suddenly, you know, it's like we're drumming outside every weekend, like this drum corps. Like it, it, it it's definitely an advantage uh, oh, for hear. those those SoCal cats. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So obviously, capped off your age out in the best way possible. Not that it wouldn't have been great if it what hadn't finished in a gold medal, but cherry on top, it was. Um, what was that show about to you? I won't say I won't I won't even say yeah. what was it actually about, but what was it about to you? <laughs> so the 2009 Broken City Seed, right? C E D E. Yeah. So I, I I mean literally the the word seed means to to give up or to or to surrender to let you win, right? And and that was the kind of main Adam Watts song that the 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 show was. Uh, driven by was it's called let you win um and um i i i always hesitate like i i've been asked this question a lot like what the hell was the show about <laughs> um and i i always kind of hesitate to like give 
my interpretation of the show um, just because I don't want to taint other people's interpretation of the show. You know, like, like that, that's, as we were talking about the whole season, that's like Mike Jackson's deep, you know, philosophy about, about it. It's, it's that it's just a nuanced uh, piece of art that is meant to be interpreted in, in, in your own way, you know, and, and, like, like there is kind of an intellectual storyline that that drove him to um, design things and, and do things certain ways. Um, but you know, as viewers, we're supposed to um, just take things as they are, latch on to what we do, latch on to, and you digest it in a different way. Everyone does, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, loosely to me the show was just about um making sacrifices giving up a part of yourself for this for the betterment of people you love so that the people you love can win essentially um and there are a lot of like really subtle hints to kind of that uh theme throughout the show like the the, the real like literal driver of a lot of the show is is a uh, parent parents to child relationship so you'll you'll hear a lot of uh you'll hear and see a lot of motifs with like uh of threes like two and one so like in the snare feature there's this just this part where we're all facing back field playing groups of two and one at the edge of the snare drum and like repeatedly over and over again while we're, we're facing back field um and that's that's kind of the the nod to that you'll also see in the drill that like a lot of people a lot of times you'll see groups of two and one like standing up and everybody else is on knee stuff like that um little just little little nods to that threes theme you you know at the end we also you know we raise the white flag like we're surrendering um and the props too it's like a a group of three um towers in, in in the back corner so um yeah, I guess I guess to me, loosely, it, the show is about um, giving up a part of yourself, surrendering, so that someone you love can win. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, it's very, sweet. Very big, well, I'll... very very philosophical, very um, abstract. Yeah, and, and very abstract. It, you know, uh, it's not for everybody, right? Like a lot of people are resistant to those kind of um, not at all literal very abstract philosophical shows um and we didn't play very much which is which a lot of people don't really like but um uh we may or may I, not have I, that sometimes up less podcast. is more but <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i mean i mean you have to understand like uh, one word that i that sh- like came up in the tapes a couple times at least that i think sums it up nicely is is refreshing Right, like you think about what WGF Finals Week is, it's just like nonstop drumming and noise that these judges are are sitting there listening to, you know, for literally, literally hours yeah. every day for three days straight. And then for us to come out there at the end and to do the literal exact opposite um, is is polarizing um, and could could have blown up in our face, but it was it almost didn't. like it a palate cleanser right like and like like you think of like um from a design standpoint to like a lot of shows are really dark right but then every once in a while there's like you know i think of pulse does some shows like this too um infinity they win fan the favorite every year shows or something yeah, yeah, yeah exactly exactly like like those shows tend to go over well um Maybe not competitively all the time, but but just in general from fans because they're different in that sense, right? And and yeah. I think this was kind of that way, um, just in a different sense. Dark is easy to do. So yeah, I mean, right. And 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 you could argue that playing a lot of notes and doing a dark show, uh, yeah, like playing a lot of notes, like everybody can do that. Everybody in the top fifteen can play a ton of notes, well, right, and and just ram notes, but not everybody can play with space 
like Broken City has over the past couple of years. That 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 that's kind of where my head is at on that on that subject. It's it's funny you use the word refreshing because you almost took the words right out of my mouth. Like I was going to speak up and just put in that loud, angry, aggressive is basically the norm for indoor drumline. Like I mean, mm-hmm. drums are an aggressive physical instrument. Like they're loud, yeah. they're in your face. It's very hard to do the tasteful thing. And that's the, the, I've not always been a fan, admittedly, of some of the things Broken City has done, but I have no, always and, acknowledged, and yeah, and, but I've always acknowledged that, that like, it's just different. It's its own yeah. thing. And, and it's not surprising at all, knowing that Mike Jackson has a big hand in that. That's the kind of thing he's doing. Because if you look at what he's doing at Blue Knights, it's, kind of, or was doing at Blue Knights, like, it's yeah. kind of the same thing. Different, um, but not in a bad way. Refreshing really is one of the best ways and simplest ways to put it, I think. Mm-hmm. Yep, and, and and refreshing has a positive connotation to it, but like it, it it definitely isn't for everybody, and and that's okay. You know, like Broken City isn't gonna be everybody's favorite group in the world. Um, you don't have but to be. That's not what. That's not what their they as an organization. Uh, seek to do like they, they're not looking to be people's favorites they're just wanting to create art that is meaningful to them and to the members and um if people like it great and but you know some people don't and that's okay to me i think if they can find a sweet spot and this is all personal preference obviously the people in charge over there know exactly what they're doing extremely smart talented experienced but if they could find a meshing, because I was raised on the cadets, that aggressive, like, my first summer was for Tom Unks, like, that's why I went to march for him at Blue Stars when he went there, and, but it, I feel like if they could find a balance between having that level of density in spots, you know, use, yeah. use that space and nuance tastefully, but then also have segments where, like, and, and there are notier segments of Broken City shows over the past couple of years, but as a fan, I would want to see a little more of that. Still keep the refreshing elements that you guys are so good at, but then yeah. also bring the element of, uh, not the word traditional, traditional is the wrong word, but like the, that element of the Ram, just the Ram. Yeah. <laughs> Have a few more moments where like, all right, we can do this thing. We can also do this thing and do it way better than you too. Yeah. And, and, and that's, to- that's totally fair. And I can tell you, truthfully as a member as a performer it's way more fun to play more notes than less right oh yeah uh, so no that yeah that's that's a totally a fair point of view for sure well sick well i'm gonna shift gears a little bit here and pivot so we've kind of gone through a lot of your performance aspects your time through competitive drumming I guess along the lines, you had made the decision to start vlogging or video record, uh, start a YouTube channel where you did a lot of like kind of day in the life of Blue Coats or Broken City or whatever. You did some Q&As. Obviously, there's some performance clips of the shows and stuff like that. What was kind of your motivation behind that or what started or inspired that or was like, oh, I kind of want to do this? Yeah. Um well, I, I've always kind of been into like just making videos for fun, like all the way back to like middle school. Um, my friends and I would just put together little uh, videos we thought were funny, and 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 oh, I was kind of just initially exposed to the world of making videos that way, um, and and that has never not been an interest of mine. Like, I, ultimately, I, like for a while, I I wasn't able to figure out how to incorporate that into my life as a hobby because I didn't have time. (laughs) Um, But like after the summer of 2017, uh, when I aged out of drum corps, um, I started to have more time and I was like, well, you know, what can I kind of do to fill this void that I'm going to have over the summer when I'm not marching drum corps. Um, And that's when the idea popped in my head to like really get a YouTube channel going um, to scratch that itch of, of creating stuff and creating videos. And, you know, luckily I kind of had an audience already for it just cause I had developed a, a little bit of a reputation from marching blue cuts. 
Um, and like thinking back to when I was in high school, you know, first starting to get to the activity, you know, you kind of idolize these people that are marching the top groups and um, really, yeah, idolize is the right word. You want to be in their shoes. You think they're the, you think they're the shit. You think they're the coolest people ever. Um, and they're, they're almost that? like, on, right. It's, they're almost like on this pedestal, like they're untouchable kind of, you know, and, and um, for the longest time, you know, I, there was a certain sense of doubt, like, will I ever, can I ever be in that position? You know what I mean? Um, and so that kind of motivated the type of stuff I, I started putting out, you know, like just giving a window into who I am as a person and, and hopefully trying to inspire people to, and, and, and get them to understand that I'm just me. I'm just a normal, awkward Asian skinny kid from Minnesota who, <laughs> who, who, who worked really hard and, and, and was able to, um, be, you know, subjectively successful in the activity, um, you know, march the groups that I wanted to march and, 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 you know, show kids that that's totally an attainable thing to do, um, and connect with kids that in, in, in that way. So, um, yeah, it's been really fun. It's been really fulfilling, you know, like, it's funny, like, I, I can rarely go to like a marching band, drum line, drum corps event and like somebody will, will usually always stop me and, and like ask for a picture or whatever, like, and say, you know, like, I, I love your videos. I really, I'm really inspired by what you're doing. And, and, and that, that's really, you know, that's not, that's not necessarily why I, I don't do it to get an ego, my ego stroked, but like, it, it's, it's kind of rewarding to um, hear that and, and know that people are, uh, watching my videos and being inspired and, and, and learning from my experiences. So, yeah, I think that that's super important to, to just pass the baton. Um, yeah, I think that that, what you're talking about parallels with kind of a lot with what Mike and I do with this. I think in, even in fact on our YouTube channel, it says something along the lines Mike typed it up. So he might know better like a window into the uh, upper levels of the activity. And part of the reason why we have, most of our guests, if not all of them, kind of go through their background of like how they got into music and then in marching band is a lot of them are very, very similar stories. Um, me being in your shoes, you being in someone else's shoes, looking back at when you're in high school and seeing those people that you idolized or these are the people I watched on YouTube or on the lot videos, you see yeah. the end result, but throughout these podcasts and through your videos, you give people the opportunity to see what's like, well, you saw one portion at the end that is not indicative of what yeah. the beginning struggles were like, right. uh, which I think a lot of people can really relate to when they're thinking about themselves in high school or maybe even college and trying to make the next step or make the next jump. And you're just like, I'll never get there. I'll never get there. It's like, well, I think a lot of people thought that at one point. I thought that at one point. Yeah. So, that's kind of like not to get all cheesy and sappy, but why partially why we do the podcast, obviously we just enjoy talking about drums and stuff. And yeah. when it's season time, just like critiquing groups and what we do like and things we don't like. But I mean, there is that sort of idea behind it that, well, maybe it'll inspire somebody to just be like, I can, I can, I can do that because they can. So yeah, I totally, dig it. Totally. I dig it. And then, uh, so you use your social media pretty rigorously, have a pretty strong following, and kids that you've developed, like you just mentioned, people noticing you, the notoriety um, at shows, which is awesome, um, and you're able to communicate and then just be a chill dude for those people. Like, I think being personable like that is the the best thing that you do is just it connects you to them. It doesn't separate yourself. Like, oh, he's this like kind of crazy celebrity person, but he's just like a, he's right. a guy. Like you said, you're just a Kyle. I'm just a uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, Asian guy. You lean into the yeah, the yeah. Asian thing. It's funny. <laughs> uh, I saw that one video, the Oriental Express. You're like high yeah, school yeah. solo. <laughs> yeah, dude, I did yeah, a deep all, dive on all you. of the all of the. Yeah, you really did. Um, yeah, my hair was bad back then, so I'm sorry you saw that. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> but yeah, all, all the ID like snare solo stuff I did, like I always tried to name them something Asian related because I don't know why I, <laughs> I just did. 
that's all right. That's all right. It's, hey, it works. It's your it heritage. Works. Tycho drumming. You yeah, were yeah, yeah. Uh, gifted the rhythm and timing from the birth. So mm-hmm. you yeah, yeah. lean into it. <laughs> um, but I guess the last thing I'll kind of touch on here um, since we've been going for a little bit is just, I guess, how you're able to incorporate your passion for drums and then your paycheck or like maybe what you do. Because I believe you you said you do like marketing or advertising or yep. something like that, right? So how you're kind of able to incorporate those things into your life and just tie those in and make them work together um, cohesively. Yeah, I, yeah, I could probably ramble for hours about this. I, I, I mean, there are there are so many parallels between like the marching arts, my career, my experience in the marching world, or just drumming in general to like my professional career and my educational career, like basically I, I attribute all of the soft skills I possess to like my time drumming, like, you know, all of the stuff that everybody has, like, like hard work and, you know, working well with others and, and, you know, leadership skills, confidence in myself um, all of that. I was able to, all of those strengths I was able to, solidify um by doing by playing the drums um in in a more literal sense um like my role in the marketing world is is i'm a brand strategist and 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 basically um brand strategy as a practice if you if you don't know what it is it's basically kind of a, a an art and a science it's a lot of um the science side is like, a, it's a lot of doing digging. It's a lot of research. It's a lot of, um, doing like interviews with people and a- analyzing data and on, on consumers, um, and, and being really detail oriented in, and nitpicky in, in finding, um, opportunities, uh, from a research standpoint. And then it's combining that with, you know, developing big ideas for how brands should position themselves and i kind of see drumming especially drumline in a a similar light like it's very detail oriented like the drums are so articulate so you have to be very um you have to get your microscope out a lot like to identify what problems are and how to play things together with good quality um you know it's it's a lot of it's about the details quite a bit, the small details, but at the same time, it's still an art form. You're still creating things. You're, you're still putting on a performance that is a work of art. Um, and so that, that parallel, um, has made my experience as a brand strategist a lot more intuitive, a lot more natural to me because I've had that experience for years, uh, in the marching world. Um, and then, and also, you know, in developing my own kind of social media following, um, like I've been able to learn what works and what doesn't, at least from a personal brand standpoint, like, like basically, basically what it all boils down to is the, the stuff that I put out that is, that gets the most positive response is just when I'm myself, which, which sounds like so dumb and cheesy, but like, it's really true. Like, authenticity goes a long way. Like if I'm trying to be performative and, and be somebody I'm not, people can see right through that. And it's the same thing with bigger brands, like with actual businesses. Like oh yeah, if, if, if companies are being performative and, and not authentic to who they are in, in, and being meaningful in their actions, consumers see right through that and, and their business doesn't do well. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of my, that's the that's my short believe it or not ramble on on, on, on the subject <laughs> no I love it I mean I I mean I couldn't agree more people crave transparency and genuine they, they want you to be genuine they they can tell when you're I mean for lack of a better words when you're bullshit I'm like and people yeah. don't care about that I mean just if you looked on social media today not to get into that whole rant of like <laughs> politicizing stuff but like People just don't like it. <laughs> they don't like it. Um, so I think it works. I, I like it too. I mean, I was I watched obviously a lot of your videos and stuff. Just kind of the dry, like satirical, like very just like 
this is me like videos <laughs> of like yeah <laughs> you when you like get an award or something like getting in your car driving to party city buying a party popper <laughs> going on the field and then like <laughs> it's like uh, it's just funny it's like yeah all right i get it um yeah but just allowing people to see your personality and make you more human um i think that's the way to go so mm-hmm. for Absolutely. sure so yeah, I think that like your personality and just for anybody who wants to witness it, I think the the hot dog audition is a good uh, <laughs> is a very good explanation and yeah. visual representation of you mixing your personality in with your abilities to brand yourself and create content and create videos and just do something that's fun but also entertaining. Mm-hmm. Um, which you did for the skull, the skull drumline. Um, <laughs> I got a kick out of it. I was like, "That's pretty creative." It just and comes it was off very, as genuine. It, it was very well as, done. Like the yeah. production value was was eight points, so. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. And um, the genuine it. nature yeah, that of that one stuff, one sure. <laughs> like the genuine nature of that stuff, I think is why you've developed somewhat of a following. I think it's just you're unapologetically you in all these videos and posts and everything, and people in today's world are assaulted with things that aren't genuine on a daily basis mm-hmm. and they really gravitate towards those things that are when they sh- when they find them so yeah that yeah then that's what i that's what i really try to do and because like i mean it, it that's like i said that's what people seem to respond the most positively to, positively to but it's also just the most fun for me to make because and it's easier because i'm not <laughs> i'm just you know being my dumb self you know so it's fun to be awkward. Yep. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> well, uh, so yeah. I think we've hit everything on the list. You got anything you want to hit Evan or Kyle, anything you want to talk about before we wrap it up? Uh, uh no. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all kind right. of the way it goes. Yeah. It kind of just, all right. Well then actually we haven't said this yet. What's the name of your YouTube channel, your Instagram account? Oh, well, both are just my name, um, but simple. I, I have an Asian last name, so I'll, I'll spell it. It's Kyle, K-O-L-E, Suchia, T-S-U-C-H-I-Y-A. Um, yeah, uh, follow me on Instagram, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I, I'm That's where I'm probably the most active. I'm also on Twitter, too, if you want, if you're interested. But uh, yeah, follow me. Let's hang out. Okay. We'll be sure to tag you and tag your Instagram and your uh, YouTube and yeah, we'll post all that. And uh, cool. if you're gonna follow, because I, I, you know, I, I measure my self worth with how many followers I have. So oh, it's all about <laughs> the likes and the clicks and everything. The man. dopamine hits. That's all that yeah. matters. So <laughs> I'll do. I'll reiterate our spiel from earlier about our social media. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Like, comment on the video. Tell your friends about it. Um, follow on Facebook and Instagram at Aged Out Podcast. Subscribe on Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well. If you prefer those platforms, hit us up on patreon.com slash aged out podcast. If you'd like to give us any kind of financial support for what we're doing here. And other than that, Kyle, this has been an awesome episode. Thanks for hanging out yeah, for, thanks, guys. with us tonight. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Peace.